Every day or so, another blow up would occur. The 18th of August saw a moderate run of 15,000 plus acres. The 19th through the 21st was relatively quiet with only a few thousand acre increases. Fire lines were being constructed and burned out despite the blow ups and major runs of the fire. New fire camps were built and some were burned out. Fire line construction was, was constructed and lost, but the fight continued. The blow up on the 22nd added another 22,000 acres. And by the end of August, another big blow up of 67,000 acres. About this time, the three huge fires burned together. Altogether, there were several seven blow up days in addition to the daily increases. September brought cooler weather, but daily runs of the fire continued until it rained on September 21st. Heavy rainfall on September 22nd ended the suppression activities. Crews were sent home and fire camps were closed and packed out. After burning over 252,250 acres, the Peach King fire came to an end. The 42 ordeal, day ordeal was over. This was one big fire. With all the figures are added up, suppression forces totaled 5,475 men, of which 2,475 were CCC crews. Total fire line constructed and held amounted to 310 miles and an additional 100 miles was built and lost. Cost of the fire suppression was $911,500. Damage was estimated at $234,000. There were no damage surveys made, so estimates are probably low, including the damage the fire costs approximately $1.1 million, which on today's cost would be probably several times more. The inaccessibility to the fire necessitated the need for many fire camps. A total of 74 camps were established, of which five were burned out. These camps were serviced by 475 head of pack stock and 233,000 miles were driven by car and truck to haul men and supplies to the fires. Much of this data was gathered from records, diaries of firefighters and interviews by C.B. Sutliff, who was involved with the suppression of fires and after it was assigned to make a report to the, in, on suppression efforts to the regional forester. With the exception of 20 miles of fire line built by bulldozers, all the fire line was built by hand tools. The statistics, the statistics of the fire were contained in the above mentioned report to the regional forester. Since the epic struggle put the Solway fire on the Solway fires, there have been many changes in the way forest fires are fought. Weather forecasting has much improved. Large fires today are provided with the latest information gathered from satellites and computer programs that cater specifically to fire weather forecasting. Daily and up to the minute forecasts deal with expected fire behavior and burning conditions. As a result of the early work by H.T. Gisborne on fire danger rating and the advances since since fire planners are much better equipped to deal with the developing situations. As fire danger increases, personnel and equipment can be deployed throughout the national force of the region or nationally to meet expected needs. There have been major advances in rating fuels, fire spread rates and fire intensities Techniques for predicting spread rates and intensities are computerized and available for fire line use. It is amazing, it is amazing that a fire, the size and intensity of Pete King 
and requiring the large suppression force that was assembled could be fought with as few accidents as resulted. Most of the CCC boys were just formed and had little or no experience in the use of crosscut saw and ax. While there were two fatalities, most of the injuries dealt with smoke inhalation and eye irritation. The CCC crews and other crews used in suppressing a fire did not receive prior training, but were thrown into the fight to learn through firsthand experience. Innovation to fire suppression, such as portable radios, cell phones, aircraft, helicopters, infrared imagery, better access, fire retardant and delivery system, computers, satellites, trained personnel, to name a few, have greatly improved the ability to fight the large fire. But as with all large fires, it is weather and fuel amounts and condition that create an atmosphere for fires to burn. I look back at the years since 1934 when burning conditions were similar, large fires occur, occurred. There were many examples, but 1961, 1967, 88, 2000, 2004, 2017 stand out. In spite of all the advances in fire suppression, when the conditions are right, we still have the big fires. Witness the summer of 2000 in the Bitterroot. In the aftermath of the 1934 fires, the Selway <coughs> National Forest was dissolved and the ranger station divided in, <coughs> into uh, uh, Clearwater and Nespers National Forest. That is the way it is. The, the far area bears little resemblance to that blackened by the fire in 1934. When the Locksaw Ranger Station has been refurbished to the way it was prior to the burn and is open to the public from Memorial, Memorial Day to Labor Day each summer. The volunteer hosts and point out remnants of the fire and and recount the highlights to those who stop. We hope as you drive, uh, drive down the Lewis and Clark Highway now and go past the Locksaw Station, you'll stop and, and view the area and, and hear the story of the fire. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Jack. <clears throat> that was hey. <clears throat> very interesting. Any questions or comments? Jim, Harmon? Oh, it, it probably happened in the in the fifties. It started a little bit. They had a <clears throat> uh, had a few hard hats to pass around, and then it went on from there. They got started about getting fire shirts, and then they got Nomex uh, pants, and and uh, it's improved since then. They, but these firefighters today. They're loaded down with, uh, they have a belt with uh, canteens hanging on it and flashlights and, and they have uh, uh, gloves. Uh, they didn't start issuing gloves till, I don't know, the, uh, the late 70s. And, uh, so things have advanced quite a little bit in the last few years.
Well, they all they had was a, was a telephone. They used messengers most of the time from one camp to the other. And uh, the uh, telephones, they could string a little emergency wire mm -hmm. for, from main points and that. But uh, basically, uh, mm -hmm. there wasn't anything. There was no radios or no chainsaws or nothing. Just to, like they said, to, the axe and shovel and Pulaski were uh, what they what they built the line with. <laughs> and, uh, and the camps were all separate. And each camp, of course, had a, had a, 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 some overhead there that would take a section of line and that was their responsibility. And so that's the reason they had so many camps. And uh, it was tough. In 1934, I was in the second grade. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, you had a question or comment? Yeah. Um, Jack, um, I'm more familiar with the national forests in the center of the state than I am in the western part and <clears throat> in Idaho. How much regrowth has occurred? What is it, <clears throat> if a person was to go there today, how much would you sense there had been a terrible fire there <clears throat> 85 years ago? I didn't quite get the question. <clears throat> how, <clears throat> how much regrowth has happened? Would you sense the forest has returned uh, quite a bit or not? If you drive down the Locksaw River uh, from here, go over Lolo Pass and down Locksaw River, it's it looks just like those that picture of the of the tree growth. It's uh, it's a green all the way down. People that stop in the Locksaw Station there don't even recognize that there was fires there in 1934. There were fires there in, uh, in 29, and there have been fires since. There's been a number of fires since that uh, have burned, but uh, it's just the tree growth is fairly rapid over there, and it, uh, it was pretty well open up until, uh, well, probably the the late 60s, there was a lot of brush came back in on uh, some of the uh, the areas, and then the tree trees began to show up above the brush. and And today, it's a uh, it's a green drive. People really enjoy driving down through that area now. Gary, you have to unmute, Gary. Okay. Good morning, Jack. Thanks for your lecture. I have a question about uh, lumber. I moved into Missoula in 1961 and logging was an industry in the city. And Judy and I recently built a house. So the issue of lumber being imported from Canada uh, came forward and lumber became expensive. As we watched forests burn by the tens of thousands of acres. Just your opinion on uh, cutting, going back into the industry of logging and producing jobs and lumber for out of the United States instead of importing. Is that something you see returning? Well, to a degree, I'm sure there'll be some. You know, a lot of areas were, uh, were pretty heavily logged <laughs> and it takes takes time for them to, to come back. And uh, I think the forest plans nowadays designate areas that, uh, that can stand to have some logging. And then of course, the, uh, a lot of people are looking at having the woods thin down a little bit so that, uh, that they don't have the fuels there that they had in this 34 fire. Those, those uh, fuels that they had that were, were tremendous, big, great big gold trees that had been burned and died and fell, fell over. And uh, 
and uh, for those crews to build line and that stuff was terrible. Now, of course, they're talking about uh, uh, doing a lot of thinning and and, uh, and clean up of a lot of the forest fuels, uh, at least around towns and places that would uh, would uh, ease the ease the uh, construction of fire line. I think there'll still be some logging. Thank you. Hey, uh, Puckett. Hey. hey. Can I, uh, did you ever get up north toward the uh, ranger station called Bungalow? Does that ring a bell? Bungalow Ranger Station? Oh, yeah. Because one of the uh, cabins at the Bungalow Ranger Station is now moved over to uh, Missoula here on the uh, uh, Forest Service History Museum on that site. <coughs> and I can remember uh, uh, back in the early 60s uh, being in Bungalow sitting on the uh, porch of that very same cabin. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's, that bungalow uh, dwelling is now out here at the, at the uh, that's right. Forest Service Museum. It's been rebuilt and it's used as an office now. And uh, they're, they're planning to, to build a, a Forest Service Museum there uh, in the near future. They've been collecting money for several years, so that'll happen. I have a great friend that was a ranger there at, uh, at the bungalow. The, the, the district has since been dissolved and it's been incorporated into, into what they call, I think, the North Fork District now. Yeah. Uh, when was your last t year working with the Forest Service? When did you retire from the Forest Service? 1982. 82. And were you at the regional office then? Yes. Uh, Wolf? Thank you, Jack, for that presentation. Um, I was wondering, you said at some point there were over 5,000 people involved. And looking at the roads and the conditions back then, how were those 5,000 people supplied with food and water and, and what they needed? Did that come out of Missoula? No, a lot of it came out of Spokane. There was a, uh, a Spokane warehouse. I think it was in, in effect in 1934. And it lasted up until, uh, oh, probably the, the, the early 60s or a little later, or maybe the mid 60s. And then they closed the Spokane warehouse and moved everything out here to Missoula. But their uh, orders, some of them were bought locally. They didn't have a, a, a good central purchase system at that time. So they, they uh, I don't know how they scrounged a lot of that stuff, but it was all trucked in to, to uh, probably to Lowell. And then they put it on uh, back strings and headed out to the various fire camps. Wow. Was there any kind of air support? Were there any airplanes involved to look at the perimeter of the fires and give out some information? Only, only the, the one that the uh, Howard Flint was, uh, he was a, the uh, regional fire staff officer at that time. And he, he was in an airplane. I don't know what it was, whatever it was, was one of the early airplanes. And uh, he flew around and, and looked at the fire, but that's all. There was no, no air support at that time. It's interesting in, uh, in a re one of the reports of the fire, there was a, uh, a letter uh, written by, uh, I forget his initials, but his last name was Arnold. It turned out it was Hap Arnold, who was the uh, later the national air uh, officer for the army, and he was he was predicting that they needed to have have use of aircraft, but but they just didn't have them at that time. It was early on, though, you know, when they when they started to jump was late thirties when they started to jump fires and then uh, they, they had uh, re uh, 
some of these old airplanes from World War II that they used for retardant. And that was all in the, in the 50s and 60s. And then, of course, then they've advanced quite a ways for different airplanes. There was no, no chainsaws, no, no uh, telephones, no radios or nothing. Connie and then Richard. Thanks so much, Jack, for your presentation. You pointed out that it was incredibly remote uh, terrain. It was very, very steep. Uh, with exception of the ranger stations, there were no uh, facilities uh, at risk. Do you think that given those situations that that and those fires would be fought today? That, that, that what? I didn't quite that, get that. Do you think that given the situations with remoteness and steepness and lack of facilities that those fires would be fought today? Well, in the, in the wilderness, no. They wouldn't probably be fought. There's been some some big fires in the in the wilderness areas, particularly the Solway Bitterroot and the and the Bob Marshall in the last well 40 years since they started uh, to allow fires to burn in the wilderness. There's been some big fires. You know, you don't hear much about them, but they burn a lot of acres there. I'd say the, the Solway Bitterroot itself has been probably way better than 50% burned over since they started that program. And, uh, and now they're, they're looking at, at uh, whether or not they would allow a fire to burn outside the wilderness. I don't know where that's ever going to go, but, but that's what they're talking about. It's... Uh, it's it's uh, interesting thing is to uh, uh, allow, allow these fires to burn because you don't know when they when they start like that that, that they're uh, that you can catch them that you can put them out and uh, witness this uh, low low peak fire that they fooled around with for a long time and wound up with quite a few thousand acres and Quite a few million dollars and and uh, one death and uh, and that was uh, that was in what 2017. Richard, hey. Richard, oh, oh Jack, I, I really enjoyed your talk as a person who loves to wander around in the woods. One line that really caught my attention was that people were fighting the fires with buckets, sacks, and blankets. So I have a sense of 20 people, some of them running around between a creek and the fire with buckets, and some of them trying to beat out ground fires with blankets. And is that at all accurate to the way they were fought? <laughs> no, that was uh, the, the, Lolo, the Lolo or the Loxaw. Historical Ranger Station. They had to, had a crew there, and uh, and they weren't uh, they were organized building line during that time when that when the fire went over that station. They were just trying to survive, and they were uh, uh, they all had uh, face coverings on, and they were they were some organization to it, all right, because they were they had a fire pump there which eventually burned out and, uh, and they were uh, throwing water on things at the, where they could. But boy, in that situation, there wasn't much they could do. And they, uh, they're like the cook throwing his coffee on the, on the fire on the, on the cookhouse and put it out. And so it was kind of a, yeah, it was kind of a chaos, something like that. But the crews on the line, though, they were all all supervised, and the uh, CCCs had supervisors for all those crews, and they went out and, and they were they were teaching them how to fight fire as they were 
they were working because those crews were green. And, uh, and I give credit to the, the CCCs because those kids had no, no experience. They came out of Chicago and, and New York and the big cities and they were uh, thrown together. The, the government at that time hired CCCs at 1st of July. That was when the fiscal year started. And so those ones that were on this far had probably been recruited and, uh, and signed up uh, early in July. And here they are in August on a far with no training or, uh, and that, but they did have supervision to uh, keep them in uh, line and, and try and teach them how to, how to build a line. Connie, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Okay, Jim Harmon. They were, they were just single tracks with a few turnouts and uh, they were built by uh, teams, horses. They didn't, uh, the, those bulldozers that they used on the fire were, uh, bulldozer just been invented not too long before that. And so they, uh, they were using them. The CCCs were building a road from uh, that followed the Lewis and Clark Trail along the, the divide between the, the Locksaw and the North Fork of the Clearwater. And uh, it's called a 500 road today and you can travel it. But they had, uh, they had some bulldozers on that and that's the ones that they moved down onto the, onto the fire. But they were... Uh, they were pretty primitive and that those, those roads were all just just a single track. There was no no surfacing other than uh, they smoothed them out with a with a grader to some degree. And uh, it had all been uh, had been horse and wagon trails before. And of course the one along the Lolo Divide uh, or the Lewis and Clark Trail was it was, uh, there had been no road there before at all, and just a pack trail. Not that I know of. There was some pretty extensive uh, report that, that Clarence Sutliff was uh, working. I don't know where he was at that time on a, on a, uh, in a force service organization, but he was on the fire and then he was assigned to write a report, which he did. And it took, uh, it, this is just excerpts from the actual report that I used here. And so the, the write-up was, was a lot more extensive. And he, uh, he covered, uh, covered a lot of that. I, I think that, uh, that that's one of the few fires that we have a real good report on. Mike Hardy, who was a, uh, worked out at the Forest Fire uh, Lab here for most of his career, he started on... Uh, he started in 1934 and uh, he'd been on a lookout over on the uh, Custer forest. He was telling me, I knew Mike fairly well. And he was the assistant ranger at Bonners Ferry when I started to work for the forest service. And uh, so I knew him, but he had a, quite a file on this fire and he had, there was only six, I think six copies of the report were made 
and uh, Mike had one of them, and that's where I got a lot of my information was from from him. But uh, yeah, it was, it's a long time since '34. <laughs> Okay, Jack. Well, thank you very, very much. May, do you have a question? Sorry. Um, I'm wondering what the philosophy was about fire suppression prior to this time. There was the fire of 1910. If the availability of the CCC Corps to have this big group of firefighting capability available influenced the fire suppression philosophy of the Forest Service in general? Well, that was started by Franklin Roosevelt, you know, when he came into office. Right. They uh, make work because of the depression. Right. And they hired these CCC boys and they used them in, uh, in various places, but the Forest Service had quite a few of them to uh, build roads and trails, work on phone lines and things like that. And they were uh, they were run by the army. Right. The army had uh, had the, the CCC camps, and then the Forest Service provided the work and the and the supervision for them. On uh, I just I just wondered if the Forest Service changed their philosophy about him, the suppression once they had this pool of firefighters that could help with that going forward. No, they, they, the, the, their direction at that time was put them out. Okay. And, uh, and there was a 10 a.m. policy in, in effect about that time. And that, uh, 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 what's his uh, can't say his name now. Uh, from, uh, Oh, shoot. I'm getting old and I forget names pretty fast, but, but uh, Gisborne was against the 10 a.m. policy. He said that it was the blackest of black days if they, if they don't get rid of that policy. And it took until 19... Uh, about early 80s before they finally before they finally dropped it but the 10 a.m policy was that you put the fire out by 10 a.m of the day following discovery wow fascinating thank you okay jack thank you very much and we reached our time next week our speaker is rachel severson she's a professor of psychology at um He's setting up something called the Living Lab in the new public library, and that's what she's going to talk to us about.